Well, this is the Body of Christ Christian Ministries. I am Bishop Leg D.C. Elliott, and welcome to our Interactive Bible Experience. Today is October the 3rd. It's Tuesday night and time for our Interactive Bible Experience Bible Study. We will be continuing on in the book of John, John chapter 14. And John chapter 14 uh, is going to be dealing with um, Jesus is the way. Jesus is the way. And so as we get ready to get started, uh, I would ask as always uh, that you uh, stay with me and uh, that you interact and remember that these messages will be posted uh, to the YouTube page so people can go back and listen to them later on. And so my prayer is that God will anoint and bless the word tonight. Bless me on this evening to allow me to go through the word and to share those things that will be considered mysteries uh, in the word that he makes them clear so that he is edified and magnified and glorified through the service that we have tonight. And so I thank you for joining. I thank you for your patience with our um, sound issues, uh, but I am excited about the word tonight. Once again, we are covering John chapter 14 and let me pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for who you are, for what you're doing, for the anointing of your word, for joining us. Thank you for uh, dwelling with us as we went through uh, praise and worship before the start of the service and anoint your word afresh and anew. Think through my mind, speak through my mouth that those things that would be considered mysteries you make clear. Bless those who have joined and those that will continue to join as we endeavor to bless you tonight. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Bless all who have given towards the ministry, and we just thank you and praise you for them right now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. So, as we get into the Word, uh, in chapter 13, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And he washed the disciples' feet and told them that if he didn't wash their feet, that they could not be a part of him. He wanted us to see the example of his humility and his service to his disciples as an example of us and what we should do. If the God of this world, the God that's above everything, uh, the son of man, the son of God, who was man on earth, who's making the way for us, who sacrificed his life for all of us, was willing to humble himself to wash the feet of the disciples. I think that shows us the level of service, the level of humility that we need to have concerning our fellow brothers and sisters. It is the demonstration of what we call the preeminent principle in the word, which is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and body, and love thy neighbor as thyself. It is the embodiment of John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his son, so that all of us who will accept him will be saved. So this act of humility <clears throat> in his declaration that the only way that we could come to the father is through him is a precursor to what we're going to talk about tonight and that is Jesus is the way to the father scripture starts this way don't let your hearts be troubled trust in God and trust in also in me 
there is more than enough room in my father's home. If a, if it were not so, I would have told you that I am, uh, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And I, I, I like this scripture and I, I, I stopped here because this is what we get caught up in. We think that what we do in accepting Jesus Christ is for this purpose, for Jesus to go and prepare a place for us, but the a place that he prepares for us, we think is a mansion in heaven. We think the place that he has for us is a mansion in heaven. And the more good works we do, the bigger and greater the mansion is that we're going to have. <clears throat> I don't know that there's any mansions in heaven. I think earth is the only place that there would be mansions when Jesus comes back and restores everything and allows us to then inhabit this world. I think the mansions that are prepared for us will be here and not in heaven. But then at that time, heaven will be on earth. And so um, this notion of aspiring to do good works, to to be the best that we can be for the purpose of earning something in heaven does not even align with God's principles to get to heaven. You just have to accept him. Earning something, he, he tells us he wants us to do what we do out of love and not out of works. So he's going to judge your heart and what you're doing. And if your heart is not for him, if your heart is just just for stuff and things, then you will get your stuff and things down here and you won't aspire or attain what it is that you desire in heaven. Because it is not aligned with God's word. And so my encouragement to you is stop banking on a mansion in heaven and basing the works that you do on what you can earn because God gave us everything that he's going to give us by grace and not by the works that we do. Pastor Shelby, what do you say? Yes, um, I, I agree um, with the with with you know it could, as far as mansions. I mean, man, if all I get is a mansion up there, I got a mansion. Now, I may have a mansion down here. I may have two or three mansions down here. You know, so you know, I don't know that. Um, you know that the, what you know that that should be the focus. Um, um, you know, as far as you know, the dwelling place. You know, specifically a mansion. Um, and the point that you're making, um, I always, uh, I definitely um, subscribe to as far as us trying to earn. Now, I, I know that we'll be rewarded for the works in one sense that um, uh, the, the good works, you know, we, if you build the foundation on, you know, gold and good things, you know, your, your works will uh, last. And then if you build on hair struggle, you know, you know, the Bible talks about that. But as far as works to uh, get something like, I'm going to, I'm going to work hard to get accepted. You know, I'm, I'm working hard, you know, so I don't lose my salvation. I'm working mm -hmm. hard so I can just make it into heaven. I don't want to lose my soul. And, you know, I, I just, it, that's, that should never be the point of, you know, of it. Um, or what you get. I mean, it, it's, that's really a worldly, a worldly perspective anyway. That uh, I like, I like the fact that you mentioned that it's a worldly perspective because I think that Jesus spoke in parables and he spoke in terms that we would understand. So what we understand is a mansion and riches. 
But what we really are supposed to be going to heaven for is relationship. Being back in fellowship with God, singing his praises. I don't think that, <clears throat> and I'm still studying this. I'm, I, 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 I've heard enough scripture that talks about not seeking after stuff and things to please God because he's given us what he's given us by grace. Now, will we be rewarded for the good works that we do? But yet the good works that we do are works that we do out of love. And so when we think of the, the two men that hung on the cross next to Jesus, Jesus talked about the one man uh, being in heaven with him. That was the goal. When we talked uh, earlier, when the uh, disciple's mother was trying to get Jesus to let her, her, her son sit at the right and the left hand of Jesus, he said, those seats are not up for him to, to grant. The stature and the place that you are in, re in reference to Jesus is not a place that, that humans can attain to, nor can uh, can it be promised to them, right? So that those ideas are contrary. Heaven is a place and it's a place where spirits dwell, not human beings in human bodies. So where would a spirit reside in heaven? Is it going to be a spiritual house? <clears throat> Make sure that grass is cut. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Is, is, yeah. it, is it going to be a spiritual house with spiritual furniture and spiritual riches? Or. Yeah. And, and, and as you can I'm, Go I'm, ahead, jump in. I mean, okay. And as you were saying, Jesus, because of his kindness and his condescension to us he he, he like um, uh, spoke in metaphors and, and, and parables like and the bible talks about crystal fountains and 12 gates to the east, 12 gates to the west but the point is not riches the, the point you know the, the, the overarching point is that we're going to be blessed beyond measure we're going to be in his presence there's nothing good that we won't have available to us i think you know so he condescended to use our language um but the point is, if you're going to go to heaven and just be like oh gold that's not the that's not the point of it you know um you know that uh, jesus wanted to um you know to, to give out but just the magnitude or that that being blessed is that any blessing available is you're going to have available any joy that's available you'll have available there any pleasures you know your spiritual pleasures that you uh there is available you'll have god and so the the point of trying to do works well, I remember Paul, Paul always said, you know, not, hey, we're saved and not by works, lest any man should boast. If, if, if God doesn't like boasting down here for the work you've done, I don't think he's going to change it, change and then get to heaven. Now you're bragging about all the stuff you did. I, he don't want you to brag down here about what you do. <laughs> you think now when you get to heaven, you be like, oh, I did this or that. Therefore, I deserve this or that. No, that ain't his nature. That, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying. That is exactly what I'm saying. Somewhere along the lines, as we read to understand, we have to understand that these human references to things that we could have down here as aspiring to have it in heaven doesn't align with God's word. And I think it is just a way to 
have us to relate to the experience of heaven. But God is a spirit. And so the experience of heaven is a spiritual experience, not a physical one. Heaven is a place, but it's not it's not the same as this physical world that we deal with. And the things that are, are from heaven, the blessings that come from heaven, it, it comes in spirit form and manifests itself in physical form so that we can experience blessings here on earth. I was just grappling with that thought process and I just want people to be free not to try to to aspire to work to get to Jesus, but aspire to have the best relationship that you can with Jesus and honor him so that you can be in the father's presence, worshiping with all of the other spirits in heaven. We call them angels. Amen. 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 So Jesus is saying there is a place for us in heaven. He's preparing a place for us. If that wasn't so, would he have told us that he had a place? Verse three says, and when everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will be with me where I am. And you know the way to where I'm going. No, we don't know, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So where are we aspiring to go to? Actually, we're aspiring to go to the Father. Because nobody can get to the Father except through Him. The Father is where we are aspiring to get to, to be back in relationship with Him, to be back in His presence. That is where the 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 euphoria for lack of a better word that we will get from being in heaven is because we will be basking in the spirit of God, which provides everything that a soul needs to be fulfilled. We'll be totally fulfilled in heaven because we'll have everything because we have him. That's where we aspire to be to. If you had already known me, if you had really known me, you would know who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am? Anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe that I am in the father and the father is in me? The words I speak are not my own, but my father who lives in me does his work through me. And I think this is another important part. When we are believers of Christ, we have the same thing in us as he had in him, which is the father who through the Holy Spirit is supposed to lead and guide and direct us and give us access to blessings, favor and grace. It is through Jesus to get to the father. So the father will come to reside with us through the Holy Spirit so that we can really experience his presence. And if we really know Jesus, if we really have developed a relationship with Jesus, then we have a connection to the father and we should be able to see the father 
not only in what Jesus did, but also in our own lives as well. Verse 11 says, just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe because of the work that you have seen me do. So once again, we talked about how the miracles were done for people to have faith. And Jesus is now still indicating that even talking to his disciples after all they have seen, he's pleading with them to believe that he is in the father and the father is in him. He's saying, or at least believe because of the work that you see me do. The works that I've done could not have been done with my own power. It had to be done in this physical world with permission from the father for me to do these things. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with my father. This is one of the most telling scriptures in the Bible. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with my father. What does it mean to do the same works that he has done? Talk to me. This is big. Well, um, you, you, you uh, talk about bringing people in right relationship, you know, to God, you know, and uh, Jesus. What did Jesus? What did Jesus do? You know, he he, he showed he he showed the Father. You can ask that. You tell us they're looking on him. You know, um, he he's he's like he showed so. And he let us know that it wasn't about him, even though it was about him. But he, was, but he was saying, "I, I want to bring you directly, you know, through the Father, well, to the Father through through Jesus." And so, um, all the works that he did, we not it's not just the works that he did um, in particular, but you know how we talk about the reasons for the miracles, the re. Those are the works that we do because they are purpose driven. So yes, it's not. I mean, they are supernatural works, but supernatural works aren't just like magic tricks. I mean, that that's not the point. They, they are purposeful, you know, because they're um, and they're all glorifying the the Father. And so we're to be purposeful with what we do, not self seeking, not trying to get a you know. Uh, some type of cultish following because it's all about us but the works that Jesus did were purpose driven they always pointed to the Father so that the men may be saved and, you know, and, and greater works that I mean the, the greater works than these basically you say well what is a greater work than raising people from the dead well that's not necessarily you know, so this it's not like greater works. It's like greater works because Jesus is not going to be there, and and we can do great. We can reach more people. We can, you know, um, well, there's that, no limit it. to what we can do. That's there's it. No limit to what God can do through us. That's it. How many people can we reach? See, what was the real work that Jesus did? So the real work that he did was not the miracles. The real work that he did was reaching the people to bring them back in relationship with God. And so that was the work that he was doing. What tools did he use to, to make that work uh, come to pass? He used miracles like a carpenter uses a hammer and nails. He used miracles he used signs and wonders to cause people to believe that God existed and God was who uh, he said he was and that he was the son and he uh, 
was who he said he was. We can't mistake the tools for the work. We're trying to say, well, Jesus did signs and wonders. And so the work that he wants us to do is signs and wonders. No, the work he wants us to do is to bring people into relationship with him. And if we can do it by preaching, if we can do it by prophesying, if we can do it through encouragement, if we can do it by example, those are the tools that we have at our disposal to do it. Could he use us to raise the dead or to heal the sick? He absolutely could. But he tells us, be it unto us according to our faith. So ultimately, if we really want to raise our level of thinking to the highest level, we have to understand that what we try to extrapolate from the scriptures, sometimes we're off because we're still still trying to comprehend it based on humanistic terms. And we're trying to apply spiritual things to this physical, confined, restricted existence that we have to make sense out of it. And when we can't make sense out of it, we struggle. And, and then our faith starts to falter because we cannot quantify the things that we're focused on but God didn't make it that difficult. He did not promote religion. He promoted relationship. That's simple. The impact that he wants us to have is in regards to how many people we can lead to him. How many generations and upon generations can we touch to lead them to him? Stop trying to emulate the, the tools that God used and use the tools that he gave you, the talents, the gifts, and the abilities that he's given you to do the work. But we have to understand what the work is so that we don't get caught up in trying to measure ourselves against the power that Jesus demonstrated and think that's the work that he's talking about. No. If I can reach one person and turn them to Christ, I have now emulated the work that Jesus did. If two or three come to Christ because of the work that I'm doing, I'm not emulating the word of Christ. And whoever those people touch through their witness and their education of the word, and their experiences, whoever they touch, if they get converted, that's accounted to me too. So the greater works is perpetual for us because it goes down generations. There's going to be generations and generations of people who interact with people that you've ministered to that change their life around and then encouraged other people to change their life around. And you'll never know the depths of what that is. That's a blessing. The revelation of understanding the work that Jesus did so that we know the work we need to do. We need to focus on what we can do, not try to do what we can't do and, and judge ourselves against things that we can't do. We need God's permission in order to do those things. And in order to get his permission, we have to accept Jesus Christ and then get in relationship with him so that we can understand and allow him to lead us to the opportunities to do those works. Cause those works are only meant to bring him glory. Verse 13 says this, you can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the son can bring glory to the father. So why will he do the works that he does? So that the son can bring glory to the father. So if you ask, you can ask for anything in his name and he will do it. But we have to understand 
how we should be asking in his name. Remember the seven sons of Sceva that tried to cast out that demon from the man and they tried to use the name of Jesus and the demonic spirit said, well, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? <clears throat> we need to remember that when he talks about asking in his name, because if you ask in his name, but you don't know him, he will not hear you. So he cannot do what you ask. <clears throat> Pardon me. Think about that for a minute. We think talking to Jesus is like picking up a phone and saying, hey, Jesus, I want a Cadillac. Can I get a Cadillac in Jesus' name? I asked in your name, so I know you'll do it for me. That's not how it works. You can't even communicate with God if your cell phone isn't on. If you have no cell service, if your phone is not linked to the towers, you can't even make the call. So you have to first get service through accepting Jesus Christ and then get a relationship so that you can communicate. And the way that you communicate with God is not just speaking words, but it is through prayer. Which means that prayer is not one way, it is two way. You have to speak and then listen speak and then listen. We do a whole lot of talking and not a whole lot of listening and wonder why the things that we're asking for does not come to pass. That's because we have a breakdown in the connection. Amen. 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 Verse 14 says, yes, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. And then Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Verse 15 says, if you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. You go back. He says, if you love me, obey my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. How do we get the advocate? We get the advocate by loving Jesus and obeying his commandments. Who's the advocate? He's the Holy Spirit who leads unto all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. So the Holy Spirit cannot be recognized by the world and the world can't receive him because they won't recognize him. The only way to recognize the Holy Spirit is to first accept Jesus Christ and get in relationship with him. And once you get in relationship with Jesus Christ, then you have access to recognize the Holy Spirit so that you can then have the Holy Spirit with you who leads you into all truth. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me since I live. Since I live, you will also live. 
When I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. This is the same for us. How do we know that Jesus is in us? Because we've accepted Jesus Christ. We accepted that he was raised from the dead. We accept the fact that he was raised from the dead and he is the way, the truth, and the life. We acknowledge him as the son of God and in the father and the father was in him. And by doing that, we have a, we not only have invited Jesus into us, but the father in us as well. Amen. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Who did he say that to? Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. So at some point we need to identify what commandments he's talking about that we should obey. Judas, but not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name said to him, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come to make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me and remember my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while you, while I am still with you. But when the father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything that I have told you. So the Holy Spirit is designed to lead us and remind us of what the word has told us when we need it, what the word has shown us as we need it. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And that peace that I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Remember what I told you, I am going away, but I will come back to you again. If you really loved me, you would be happy that I am going to the father who is greater than I am. I have told you these things before, before they happen so that when they do happen, you will believe. I don't have much more time to talk to you because the ruler of this world approaches. He has no power over me, but I will do what the father requires of me so that the world will know that I love the father. Come, let's get going. Amen. Powerful chapter strong information how awesome is God in telling us through Jesus Christ who he is how we can get to him that he's not going to leave us alone that he's here to bless us but that he also requires us to do a work bless the word and bless each of you is my prayer.